Uh, welcome to the third National Debt Conference organized by Prime Institute. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, there's a diverse group of people here, including policymakers, uh, legislators, soon to be, as well as experts, researchers, and journalists, and people from other walks of life, including, of course, business. Now, let me introduce you first to Prime and what we do. Prime Institute is a public policy research organization, a think tank dedicated to the ideals of liberty and, lim and limited government, free markets, and development. Our mission is to increase understanding of public policy based on these principles. We are fiercely independent and nonpartisan, with distinguished scholars from across Pakistan. Our primary focus is to analyze the domestic and international policies of the federal government. Do such policies expand or inhibit liberty? If policies restrict freedom, we work to correct that. For example, why is Pakistan ranked 126th in economic freedom? Should the government be involved in industry and production? What policies should be adopted to protect Pakistani citizens? And many such questions. Our philosophy can be described as libertarian which is interpreted generally to mean fiscally conservative and socially liberal. <laughs> we organize summits, dialogues, and lectures which are open to the public. We have, pub we have published monographs, peri periodical reports, and books. Our events and publications have evolved around a wide range of uh, economic issues such as free trade, informal economy, housing policy, social protection, export development, national debt, and the power sector. Our experts, we are, our experts, uh, sorry, hundreds of stu students apply every year to our comprehensive internship programs. Every year we hold the national uh, debt conference where we acknowledge uh, citizens and their right to live in a country which is free from debt and where they have ability, uh, availability of credit. Our overriding concern is not with politicians, but with opinion leaders and the Pakistani public, who we reach out through op-eds, media interviews, podcasts, audiobooks, and our websites, along with our books. Freedom needs a voice in Islamabad and the national media, and in the national media as well. If that is a value that you share, then support us. We, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, the official Twitter handle for this event is NDC3, so please use the hashtag NDC3 for the remainder of the event. Um, now I'd like uh, to call upon the stage the speakers for the first uh, session. Uh, please, Ms. Uh, Aisha Malik, can you take the stage? Ms. Aisha Malik is from the Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom. Uh, Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom is, uh, has been the supporter of the National Debt Please, I should. Has been the supporter of the National Debt Conference for the last three years, uh, and this uh, particular debt conference has also been organized uh, by the Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom. It has been supported by them. Um, at the same time, uh, please have a seat. Executive Director of Policy Research Institute of Market Economy, Ali Salman, please. Yeah. Um, and uh, finally, Dr. Ashfaq Hassan Khan. Uh, and Dr. Manzoor Ahmed. Thank you all for jo joining us on the stage. Um, uh, just uh, uh, for your information, the uh, uh, Prime has been working on the issue of national debt uh, for a while, since we started uh, our work in 2013. And there has been one uh, book that has been published in regards to this in the same context, as well as three uh, major conferences that were held, uh, um, uh, that, uh, of the third of which uh, we are in right now. Uh, the idea about uh, public debt, uh, uh, the prime team, and uh, we're very proud of this, were out at the press club two days ago on the 10th, uh, protesting against the debt. And uh, 
what is there to uh, mention is the fact that uh, apart from us, there weren't very many people. And so a lot of people do not understand why exactly we were protesting against the debt, why it is such a critical issue. But um, that said, uh, the purpose of holding this conference, the purpose of holding that protest was to bring attention to the idea of death, that it is critical to the well-being of this country and the future sovereignty of this country. Um, and while piling, the piling of debt itself is uh, not a significant issue in itself, uh, the effects, the ripples that it causes, the impact it has on income distribution, that remains to be examined. With that said, I call upon the stage Ms. Aisha Malik to uh, introduce Frederick Newman Foundation and the event to you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, short FNF, to the third National Debt Conference of our partner Prime. FNF is a German foundation working in Pakistan since 1986, committed to human rights, liberal democracy, and free market economy. Our partnership with Prime was formed in 2013. It is a great honor for me to take part in the opening of this event. And I'm very happy to be with our distinguished guests, a wide range of stakeholders ready to debate and exchange views. I'm looking forward to learning from the valuable input and expertise on such a crucial topic as national debt, which is affecting the development of Pakistan in so many ways. I hope for a fruitful and constructive discussion. Thank you very much for your attention and cooperation in advance. Wishing you a su successful event. Thank you, Aisha, for that. Uh, now, now I call upon the stage Mr. Ali Salman, who will be introducing the National Debt Conference, the third National Debt Conference, and the themes associated with the event. Please, welcome on the stage Ali Salman. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sayyid, for the uh, introductions. Um, so uh, this is the third National Debt Conference. Uh, why we are doing this? <laughs> um, have we stopped government from borrowing <laughs> in the last three years? Have we encouraged uh, more fiscal prudence? Uh, what we have really done from these conferences? And why we are organizing uh, this forum consistently? Um, and um, you know, why we are here today again? and sort of the takeaways and the objectives of this conference. This will be sort of uh, my short inputs. Um, as I said, um, the, the basic uh, rationale is that if you take and consider public debt uh, as an important or one of the most important challenges which the economic governors uh, or economic managers of this country faces, then uh, you can consider that this is perhaps the uh, only uh, independent forum which has been created um, and exists in the country to discuss uh, the public debt uh, issues from um, business perspective and also from fiscal perspective as well as from civil society perspective. Uh, the echo uh, from the second National Debt Conference uh, is still uh, there in, uh, in government speeches. It was here in this very hall last year when um, eminent economist uh, of the country, Dr. Hafiz Pasha, uh, you know, brought the figure of uh, the, the risks of rising public debt um, and the figure of $90 billion uh, was uh, the sort of the headline uh, from this very conference. Um, that uh, might have meant some people were not happy with the, in, within the government, but uh, we still thought that we should carry on this exercise. And this, this very debate and this very question um, is, is, is why here uh, we are um, together. Um, Dr. Hafiz Pasha could not join uh, this conference, but um, his uh, support is very much there, and as Dr. Ishfaq could also Later on, uh, tell uh, maybe share that you know his uh, some of his input have been incorporated. Uh, 
Um, so we remain as the independent forum to debate uh, the the national debt um, within within the country. The the agenda setting of the debt conference, uh, how we collect topics, uh, is very important at part of the whole process. So while I am saying that we are independent forum, it's very important to announce that we remain engaged uh, with the government, with the Ministry of Finance, uh, with the private sector, with chambers, with media, with independent economists, to come out with the list of topics and to come out with the list of issues that we wish to highlight today. And, uh, and, and you know, that's why I hope, our hope is that uh, while we are going to discuss uh, a lot about uh, sustainability of, uh, of the debt, we are only. We are also going to listen to uh, the solutions, uh, recommendations. What lies ahead for the country? How can we come out uh, from this crisis? Or maybe whether there is a crisis or not, because obviously there is a very huge divergence of uh, opinion. Um, um, you know, government at one side, and you know, most of the economists on the other side. So we very much hope that this conference again would help to articulate and crystallize the public debate uh, problem from the perspective of civil society, private sector and citizens of this country. We remain engaged with this as a civil society initiative. That will then hopefully lead to an influence, you know, an influence uh, not just the debate but also the, the, the legal and institutional reforms that define uh, the debt limitation and fiscal respons responsibility. That then we hope that will help also help in achieving uh, indigenous growth and minimum reliance on borrowing on behalf of our future children, future and children. Uh, going inside the agenda of the debt conference itself, I'm sure that by the time we took to start this conference, you would have glanced through through this. Uh, uh, and there's also a short paper in this in the folder you have been provided, which uh, talks about the recommendations from the previous two con previous conference, and also a book, in fact, from the first conference. So you have you you, know, you can connect certain themes out there. Um, just after me, we will we're going to have a keynote address by Dr. Ishfaq Hassan Khan, who will talk about past, present, and future. And then, after a short break, we will go into the more technical aspects, the broader question of sustainability. And let me share with you that um, we are very hope we are, we are hopeful that we will have both two sides of the debate. So, uh, so there will be maybe a view which will say that okay, the debt is the debt level currently is not sustainable, and then there will be a view which will say that okay, we are not Greece. Uh, so you will hear, uh, I hope, that both sides of the debate quite um, objectively and maybe you will build on your own perspectives based on the analysis and the data going to be presented today. And then um, we are also going to talk a later uh, part of the day um, in more br broader issues uh, which, which, uh, which the debt has you know, consequences for the private sector. The debt has consequences for the society, and also it has, uh, a, you know, a, a relationship uh, with the with the issues of legitimacy. And we'll also listen to um, a sort of a, you know idealistic notion uh, of of a debt-free Pakistan. Can we talk about it? Can we, uh, you know, build certain populations around it? It's it's about debate. It's about encouraging more and more ideas around it. So you will hopefully hear uh, our speakers uh, who have really um, contributed in making this debate uh, more fruitful. Uh, we are here, we are, you know, all of our, you are here because there are speakers from different walks of life who have uh, not just uh, traveled today and taken out a day, but also have spent long hours in preparing for this uh, conference. And uh, media is also here, um, and we definitely hope that uh, this voice uh, would not just remain inside this hall, but also travel um, uh, much beyond uh, this hall today. 
Um, so I wish um, all of you a very successful conference and maybe I can, just to save on time, I can directly invite Dr. Eshfaq Hassan Khan to, to, to present his keynote address to this forum. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and also giving me this opportunity to uh, speak on a very important subject. Every day uh, when you watch television, somebody must be talking about debt. So at least uh, 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 partly ourself and partly uh, Prime uh, created that awareness among the masses that they started looking to the numbers. S Salman, in his opening statement, talked about that this is the third conference and uh, did we stop uh, uh, the country taking the debt? I think there is appears to be a positive relationship between the number of conference and the pace at which we started borrowing. So this, is, this might be your contribution. Okay. <clears throat> the topic uh, which was assigned to me was national debt, past, present, and future. Past is known, present is uh, not very uh, – uh, you, would, you may not like this, and future is certainly very dangerous, the way we are borrowing. Somebody must uh, stop the finance minister to borrow in such a, such a speed. In three months' time, we have borrowed almost uh, $3 billion in three months' time. In three weeks, in three weeks, we have lost $400 million of reserve. So you can see the speed at which the reserve is declining. And in order to protect the reserve, naturally, you have to borrow more. So when I discuss the future, there will be certain assumptions that the pace will continue like this and the government has certain target of reserves that they want to maintain. So even when there is a pressure on target, the government will borrow to keep the reserve level at where it is today so that there is no pressure on exchange rate. So under this assumption, I will make forecast, but let me tell you something that since you are all here, not everybody is economist here. So I would like to start with what is debt? Why are we here? Now in a very plain language, if your monthly salary is say 100,000 rupees, and your expenditure is 150,000 rupees. So naturally, there is a gap of 50,000 which you will borrow. You borrow from either your from family, friends, or you will continue to use your past saving from the bank. So in the month of November, if your earning and expenditure profile remains as it is, at the end of November, you will be incurring a debt of 50,000 rupees. Next month, if that persists, you will add another 50,000 rupees. And hence, the debt will keep on rising. So the bottom line is, the larger the gap between your earnings and your expenditure, the more you borrow. 
the more you borrow the more rapidly you accumulate debt so what is debt when a government spends more than than the revenue it collects it borrows from various sources to finance this revenue expenditure gap therefore the accumulation of past borrowing from domestic sources domestic sources alone is known as domestic debt similarly when a country imports more goods and and more goods and services than it exports goods and services it borrows from various sources to fill this gap and this gap will be filled in dollar because this is an ex a gap between exports of goods and services and imports of goods and services therefore you borrow in dollar term so the accumulation of all such past borrowing is known as external debt this is what is the typical uh, explanation of debt but in 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 a general uh, in it in a for public to understand that there are two types of debt we only know domestic debt and external debt this is not the right way to explain the debt it is public debt and external debt and when we when we say public debt it has two components the rupee component and the dollar component why we have we call this public debt because if you look at your budget deficit you finance your deficit not entirely from domestic sources you also borrow from external sources to fill this revenue expenditure gap so you are filling the gap both from rupee side and from dollar side so it cannot be domestic debt because you are filling your budget deficit because you are borrowing in dollar term as well and also in rupee term therefore it is known as public debt national debt total debt and then you have external debt which is a sub subset of your public debt and i don't want to go into the technicalities uh, at this moment next what causes public debt to rise and what are their consequences why should we worry why should we worry about debt what causes persistence of large budget deficit and current account deficit because these are the two gaps one is a gap in domestic account and the other is gap in the external account so persistence of these two gaps the larger the gap the more we borrow so it causes this is one of the causes of the rise in debt the second is sharp depreciation of exchange rate for example if you have a dollar 100 dollar of reserve uh, sorry debt and your exchange rate today is 60 rupees equal to 1 dollar if you convert that dollar into rupee to, to make it a public debt it will be 6000 rupees but your exchange rate depreciates from 60 rupees per dollar to 100 rupees per dollar and you have not borrowed a single dollar your dollar debt remains 100 your debt is 10000 rupees so without borrowing a single dollar your debt increase from 6000 to 10000 rupees so that is why sharp depreciation of exchange rate also is one of the factors that causes public debt to rise then decline in non debt creating inflows when you have a gap in your external account you fill this gap there are two ways to fill this gap one is known as debt carrying uh, uh, non debt creating inflows and there is a debt creating inflows what are those non debt creating inflows foreign direct investment portfolio investment if you privatize anything in dollar that is one of your proceeds and then grants like saudi grants 1.5 billion dollar these are non debt creating inflows and these inflows fill the gap without adding to debt but when you borrow from world bank 
Asian Development Bank or from the IMF, they add to debt. You fill the gap through adding debt. So if there is a decline in non-debt-creating inflows, your reliance on debt-creating inflows will rise, and hence it will lead to rise in public debt. Then you also borrow. If you have a reserve target that we want to maintain a reserve of which is sufficient to provide cover of say four months of import, and if that level is declining, you borrow to maintain that, uh, to maintain that level of uh, reserve. This is exactly what we have done in the last two three years. We borrowed extensively to build reserve, and that has added to our debt. So these are the causes of rise in public and external debt, and there is the consequences. What are the consequences? It is a major source of macroeconomic instability. Instability. Then poor growth performance. Show me a country in the world who is highly indebted and yet it is its growth is accelerating. It cannot. It is against economics. Yes, you can manipulate the statistics to give, to give a very good a high growth rate, but that will be known as manipulation. When you have a poor growth performance, unemployment will rise, which is what we are observing. I come from a university, and I see when students have a degree and not finding jobs for over 15 months now, this is a reflection of poor growth performance. On paper, you can have a very good, nice growth rate, 5%, 5.5%, but in reality, you have a 2.4 million young graduates with degree finding difficulties in getting jobs. We have never seen, at least in my nine, eight, seven years of stay in NAST, I have never seen such a bad situation for graduate, unemployed graduates. Then, naturally, when you have a large debt, you go to international institution and you lose your financial sovereignty. On paper, you are sovereign, but your Ministry of Finance and the policy is run by someone else who may not have a good quality economist, unfortunately. Inter like national institution, international institutions are, are, in, institutions are also losing good quality of manpower because we deal with them on a regular basis we know how their quality are deteriorating and imagine that those who are in charge of running this country and if their quality are deteriorating over the years what will be the situation in our country then so this is exactly what we are witnessing today. Now, this is some indication of the gap, one gap, which is fiscal deficit. As you can see, we have maintained a very large gap. On one hand side, this is the decade of the 90s, where we accumulated most of the debt. On the left hand side, the bar is the gap, is the, is, represents the budget deficit as percentage of GDP. And on the right hand side, you can see the similar things are emerging in the decade of 90s and for the last 2007 2008 onward. Large gap between revenue and expenditure. And you will see immediately that this is the two period in which we accumulated heavy debt. They are all linked with each other. This is the beauty of economics and statistics. You cannot cheat. Next. 
This is gap in your external account. The larger the gap, the more you borrow. For some period, we had maintained a surplus, and then we have a deficit on the right-hand side. We are lucky today that our current account deficit is not high, much high, because our economic activity has slowed down. So slower economic, economic activity leads to lower demand for import. And hence, it reduces your overall current account deficit. Secondly, we are fortunate that our oil prices have declined substantially. These are the bonanzas, God gifted. That is why on the right hand side you see very smaller gap. Next. Look at the rise in debt. The trajectory. As if we live in a two different world in Pakistan. Rise in public debt. Some of you may be asking why you have reported this public debt in rupee term, in absolute number. There is a method to this madness. If this is a madness, that I have reported this in absolute number, people would say that you should have reported this public debt as percentage of GDP. Yes, I know that. You don't have to tell me. But you know how many times we have revised the GDP, it becomes non-comparable now. In 2007-2008, we changed. The, we moved to national income accounts, SNA 2008, and it changed many things in GDP, and the size of the GDP just simply enlarged. Then in 2003-2004, we rebased our GDP, and then again sizing increased. So we have three regimes here if from 90s and onward. We have three different regimes. Three times GDP has changed. And fourth time we are going to change now. The problem with our Pakistan Bureau of Statistics is that when they change GDP, they don't go back to make it consistent with the history. So we don't have any consistent time series data of GDP beyond 10, 10 years time. We have a 70 years of history and we don't have GDP number consistent with each other for the last 10 years only, beyond 10 years. So you cannot compare public debt as percentage of GDP because we have a three sets of GDP. Next, this is external debt. For some time, you can see debt in absolute number also declined. And this is the period, which is 99-2000 onward. And until 2005-2006, you can see in absolute number the debt is declining. And then we entered into a different world. Remember that? You have seen that two uh, when we sh I showed to you the deficit number, I said there are two different sets, one in the decade of 90s and one 2008 onward. This is exactly what is reflected here in external account also. And in a moment you will see that these two period, how much they contributed to Pakistan's external debt. Next, look at this number. Nowhere you can find this number from 1947 to 40 and 48 onward. Perhaps I am the only person who has consistent time series data from 1947-48 onward. Because I was forced to prepare, I sat for three weeks in economic affairs division and gone through hundreds of files to collect these numbers. So, Today we have about $73 billion of debt. 
this is external debt by the way this number is consistent with the state bank number and the IMF number if you look at the IMF report I have this IMF report with me and it also gives the same number but we have a different number in Ministry of Finance anybody can see this this is the number given in the IMF report so this is not my number and State Bank of Pakistan also provide this number except the Ministry of Finance they have their own definition own world and this is public debt so these are all consistent 20 trillion rupees of public debt this is uninteresting the next slide will tell you the picture next look at this this is the change addition to debt in different time periods between 1948 and until 1960 in 12 years we added 145 million dollar of debt we added we added 145 million dollar of debt oh, sorry Between 60 and 70, the decade of 60s, we added about 2.8 billion dollar of debt in the decade of 60s. In decade of 70s, we added six and a half billion dollar of debt. Decade of 80s, almost 10 billion dollar of debt. Look at this decade, decade of 90s, and according to the Ishar Hussain, this is regarded as a lost decade for Pakistan. We added 17.3 billion dollar of debt in the decade of 90s. This period, approximately 3.8 billion dollar of debt between 2000 and 2007. And look at this, between 2008 and 2016, how much? 32.6 billion dollar of debt accumulated in last eight years, my dear. That is why you have seen such a large gap, large or long pipe on budget deficit which I showed to you. One was decade of 90s and the other was between 2008 and 2016. Look at how much we added here, 17 billion dollar. And how much we added here? 30, 32, 33 billion dollars. So out of 73 billion dollars of debt, total stock of debt today, we added 50 billion of dollars of debt in just two periods, decade of 90s and 2008 onward. Out of 73 billion dollars of debt, the stock which we have today, we added 33 billion dollar from 2008 to 2016 and 17 billion dollar in decade of 90s and this is 50 billion dollar so out of 73 two-thirds debt were accumulated in these two periods this is bari bari regime bari bari regime Next. Yeah, this is the latest one. July, September, first quarter of this fiscal year. Between July and September 2016. This is the latest number we have. And how much, this is also the source wise given here. But the most worries part here is, look at the borrowing from commercial bank. In three months, we have added, borrowed approximately billion dollars from commercial bank. Which commercial bank? 
نور بینک ظفر نور بینک ڈی آئی بی آلسو اسٹینڈرڈ چارٹر ان سے بھی بور دیز آر دی نان ٹریڈیشنل سورسز آف بورنگ وی ہیو نو آئیڈیا ہاؤ ایٹ وٹ ٹرمز آف کنڈیشن وی ہیو بوروڈ دس منی دس از اے نیو ڈیولپمنٹ وچ از ٹیکنگ پلیس بورنگ فرام کمرشیل بینک Look at this, out of which we already made a payment of $250 million, the net inflow is $650. So in first quarter, we borrowed $1.7 billion. And by the way, we floated Sukuk on 16th of October, which is not here. So if you add that, almost $3 billion in three, three to four months' time. This is the pace of borrowing which is taking place. So net addition is $900 million. Right? In just three months. This is the pace. Next. This is the long series. If anybody wants, can use this. Next. This is debt servicing. And the important part is, since I will be using in forecast period as well, as well look at the amount of, the larger the debt, the debt, size of the debt, the more we pay in terms of debt servicing. So it has, it has been increasing rapidly. And look at debt as percentage of your exports. It's debt servicing, this is debt servicing as percentage of exports from 19 to 30 now. So one third of our exports earning is going for retirement of our past borrowing. Right? And this number is going to further rise as we move forward, as you will see in a moment. Next. Next. This is the share of domestic debt in public debt. It was 50%. Then it started increasing to 70%. Today it is 68%. So domestic, the share of domestic debt is rising in public debt. What is the meaning of this? Domestic debt is more expensive than the external debt. Therefore, the size of interest payment will keep on rising because we are borrowing the high cost debt. Domestic debt is high cost. This is the short term debt. Less than one year in, 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 in domestic debt was 54%. It is, today it is about 37%. Next, I don't want to go into the details. Uh, now, this is the last part of my presentation, which is interesting, which will be interesting for you. In this forecast, there are certain assumptions. One is the exports. This is my forecast for exports. And you will be surprised that last year, when I made a forecast for 2015-16, this was $23.2 billion. And this debt was $69.8 billion. I made a forecast. In the last four or five months, it all changed. It all changed. This number is now $73 billion. Even I was wrong. I was, I, and I was made to be wrong. Why 69.8? Bahadu Sizada Kardinga, Fikar Nakuru, $73 billion. Bale Dirty Dirty Mane, I did this forecast. This year, I don't know whether this will be the, or the, it will be $85 billion, I don't know. Because this was my $68.9 billion, became $673 billion. The forecast was $23.2 billion exports, ended up with $22 billion. So, in, in predicting this number, 
Let me start from here. This is our external debt. Assumption is that the current pace of borrowing will continue. Number one, export performance is, 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 is before you. We may not be able to achieve even the export of 2013-14 in the, after the next four or five years. Every day, you see a television uh, uh, ad in the newspaper. Yesterday, Aptama had an ad. They gave an ad, and today the same ad is now appeared as a news item. Aptama is right. Today, news item ke taur pe wo chhapa hua hai. Save us, please save us. For the last 28 months, nobody is listening to them. Can you imagine a government? Exports are continuously on the decline and nobody is listening. This is a strange. And then, third assumption is that government is trying to keep the reserve to, uh, equivalent to the four months of import. So if the reserve falls, they will borrow more. to maintain that level of reserve. Therefore, under these assumptions, this is my forecast. Today, we are here. Next year, our debt is going to be a stock of debt, $81 billion, and by 2019-20, $110, $110 billion. $110 billion by 2019-20, and 2008, it will be, 18, it will be 90, 90 billion dollars. Debt servicing is going to rise from 6 to about 10 billion dollars. This is the export performance. External debt to export, it was 270 percent in 2014-15. The equivalent number of Bangladesh was 88 percent and India was 80 percent while we had 270%. With this rise in debt, and this, with this export performance, you can see that our ex external debt to export will be about over 440%. Certainly unsustainable. And external debt servicing, almost 40% of our exports proceeds 40% of our export proceeds will go for financing debt, uh, 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 debt servicing. Next. What will be the, our external financing requirements? How much dollar we will be requiring? What will be the external financing requirement? This year it is $15 billion. Next year $18 billion. And this is going to rise to $22 billion. This is the debt servicing plus current account deficit. This is the current account deficit for this year. Already in one quarter the deficit, current account deficit is $1.5 billion already. Last year, in the comparable period, it was $500 million, so three times more already in first quarter. Next year, this, because, why our current account deficit is rising? Because CPEC-related imports will be coming. So this is the total requirement of our in billion dollar. And also, we have maintained that the government will be borrowing to maintain that level of reserve, which will be sufficient to provide cover for four months of import. Next. These are the traditional flow of, res of resources which are coming from traditional sources. The Chinese financing, you can see that this this Chinese financing is saving you a little bit if they come. It will be it will reach to the peak, $5.5 billion. 
if the government wants to complete all its project, power sector projects related. Today, NEPRA reminded the government that you may not be able to achieve your power sector targets by 2017-18. Our NEPRA has been scared. And the delay will be six months to three years. Again by NEPRA. Read today's dawn, front page story. Then foreign investment, and this is the likely inflow of dollar. So on the one hand, we have a requirement, and the other hand, likely inflows. So, so the gap is the financing gap. Next, this is the financing gap. These are the two dangerous area, 1819 and 1920. From where will you will get nine or eleven billion dollars after exhausting all your inflows? The gap will exist. So, my dear, Madame Lagarde was here and she offered already. Yes, we are ready, sir. Whenever you want, we are happy. We will be happy to welcome you back. This is the time to go back. She came here to tell you that we are ready to receive you. This is a temporary separation. You have been one of our best customer. Prolonged user, we are one of the nine prolonged users of the IMF resources. But temporarily, we get separated and then we reunite. So, this is the time when we will be reuniting once again. Next. Should we continue to live like this? Or do we need to have a borrowing strategy? Some suggestions here that what should be our borrowing strategy? We have to look into currency mix and terms and conditions. As I stated, we, are start, we have started borrowing from commercial banks. We don't know what is the terms of conditions. We have agreed to them. Then, these are the, this should be the parameters of borrowing. Whatever project that this will be our current account deficit, uh, we need to fill this. Then, these are the amortization payment. We have to make payment, and for which we require dollar. If there is a reserve target to achieve, then additional borrowing. And then what is our development priorities for which we will be needing dollar from our external sources? It's a summary and then you prepare. At least we will be able to know that this this should be this will be current account deficit. This is amortization payment, and this is our reserve target. And this is our development priorities which, for which we are borrowing. We don't have any borrowing strategy at this moment in time. Next. So let me conclude by saying that Pakistan debt situation has deteriorated rapidly in recent years. Pakistan added approximately $33 billion of debt in two periods, nine, decade of 90s and 2008 to 2016. We built foreign exchange reserves mostly through expensive borrowing. Somebody will have to repay this at some, some time. We wrote a letter to the IMF on October 24. The Ministry of Finance replied on November 4, and we also responded to Ministry of Finance yesterday. I will urge all of you to read these three correspondence. 
But what was funny and surprising to us that we wrote a letter to Masood, but the reply came from Salman Saab. It was an open letter to the IMF, responded by Ministry of Finance. Strange, hai, nahi hai. <laughs> so we, we also express our surprise that at least we could have expected somebody from the IMF would be responding, if at all, if at all. But the response came from Ministry of Finance, which surprised us. So we replied back. And uh, one of the questions was that, no, 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 no. It was not 16 waivers. Shabazz Rana, it was not 16 waivers. It was 15 waivers. This is the response from the Ministry of Finance. One of the element that, no, no, the IMF did not give us 16 waivers. It was 15 waivers. What a response. Then, we did not, this reserve is not accumulated through, exclusively through borrowing. I said, look, on June, end June 2013, our reserve was $6 billion. End June 2016, reserve was $18 billion. How much we added? 12. In June 2013, our external debt was $61 billion, as you have seen. In June 2016, it was $73 billion. The difference, $12 billion. So how can you say that this is not entirely accumulated through borrowing? Two plus two is four. <coughs> So we responded to that. So here also, we built foreign exchange reserve mostly through expensive borrowing. Somebody will have to repay this debt. Therefore, when the repayment comes, the reserve falls, we will borrow more because we have to maintain a reserve of four, four months worth of import. Finally, our conservative estimates suggest that Pakistan's external debt may reach $110 billion in the next four years. External debt servicing may rise to $10 billion in the next four years. Thank you very much, sir, for your patient hearing.